Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessings of the word of truth. I pray, Holy Father, that your spirit may abide with us as we study, that you open and illumine our minds. We're sad to see the Sabbath go, dear Lord, but we're so thankful for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I pray they be with all those who may be on their way, and I pray they uh, bring up the brethren during the week. Lord, we have families and jobs to take care of, dear Lord, but the enemy is intentionally determined that we miss out on the blessing that you desire to give to us during this week. And so I just pray, Holy Father, that you would please keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's uh, certainly another point I would definitely seek to make. Satan will try as much as he can to ensure that you do not come out to these meetings during the week. And again, we're all grown adults. We have families. We have jobs. We have to do all of that. But in light of the time that we're living in, in light of what is about to come upon the earth, do you think that we, make, that we can make the sacrifice as much as is possible to come out to these meetings? You know, the Bible says that when the people heard John the Baptist, when they heard Jesus preaching, that the people would literally leave their homes. And mind you, there was no Uber back in that day. There, there was no mass transportation. They literally had to walk and travel for hours even days as it were to go hear these men preaching in the wilderness and in, dif and, and in these different localities, but they made the sacrifice because they really believed that these men were messengers from heaven. And so by the grace of God, I believe that we can make that sacrifice as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So this here is a symbol of time. This here is a symbol of of time. Now the message that we have for tonight, this morning we went through a message. What was the title of this morning's message? Just a little while longer. Yes, just a little while longer. Today's message is entitled a distinct people. Now do you think that we are a distinct people as seven day Adventists? Yes. Something else I want to encourage as well. I didn't mention this before. As much as is possible, please bring a pen and paper to these meetings. We're going to go over a tremendous amount of things, and I'm telling you, it's going to be impossible for you to remember everything in your mind. It's going to be impossible. You're going to want to go back and study these things with your family and with your friends so that by God's grace, you can come to a concrete understanding of what the Lord is communicating. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. And First Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about the experience of ancient Israel. Now notice what the Bible says as it pertains to how we should relate to the experience of these men. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 11. The Bible says, Now all these things happen unto them for what? In samples, yes. And they are written for whose admonition? Our admonition. Now, now notice the context. Upon whom the ends of the world are what? Now, were the ends of the world coming upon Paul and the other apostles and the believers at that time? No, the apostle Paul stated very clearly in 2 Thessalonians that the people living at that time were not to look for the second coming in their time. So in context, this had to be speaking about us. Does that make sense? Amen. All right, now let's turn to the book of Romans. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 4. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 4. Notice what the Bible says. It says, for whatsoever things were written, what? Aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Might have hope. So these things that have happened in the past, 
They were to give us hope and encouragement as we looked upon these past experiences. Does that make sense? All right. This is taken from a book called The Great Controversy. We remember that book, Great Controversy. This says the work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious what? So what God is saying that there are similarities between how God has worked in the past and how he's going to work in the present. Does that make sense? So as we look at how God has worked in reformations of the past, we have to study these experiences to understand how God is going to work in this day and age. So is understanding history critically important? And it's so sad the way Satan has uh, construed the educational system where one of the subjects that young people hate the most is history. And especially us here living in America, we are the most ignorant people as it pertains to history. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for what time? For our own time. Now, can we uh, list some of the great movements that God has raised up over the centuries in order to forward the work of God? The Protestant Reformation. Now, who here has ever heard about the Protestant Reformation? Have we ever heard of a man by the name of John Wesley? What about William Tyndale? What about Martin Luther? What about Theodore Beza? Anybody ever heard of him? Anybody heard of a man by the name of John Calvin? Anybody heard of John Knox? All right. So this was one of the movements that God raised up. Now, was there a reformation that John the Baptist and Jesus initiated during their time? Now, do you think it would be important to understand the principles of reformation that they followed in order to bring about long lasting results among the people? What about Elijah and Elisha? Did they initiate a reformation in their time? What about Noah? Yes, what about Enoch? Yes, do you think it's important to understand and study the experiences of those men? Yes. All right, this is a symbol of something called the royal lineage. The royal lineage. All right, now can everybody discern what this is a picture of? Yes, this is a picture of Noah. Now was Noah a mighty man of God? Now, he lived during a time called the antediluvian period. The anti, this is a symbol of the patriarchal period, a symbol of the patriarchal period. Can everybody see what this is? This is a symbol of the sanctuary. Now, what particular people were living during this time of this sanctuary here? Yes, this is the sanctuary in the wilderness. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of... Exodus, we're going to turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter 25, Exodus chapter 25, Exodus chapter 25, Exodus chapter 25, and we're going to start in verse 8. The Bible says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may do what among them? Dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Even so shall ye do what to it? Even so shall ye make it. So this was the sanctuary that was associated with the children of Israel. Now, this is a symbol of the Jewish nation. Now, remember. We're talking about the royal lineage. So first we have the patriarchs during the time of the antediluvians. Then we went to the Jewish nation. All right. Next now, can everybody discern what this is a picture of here? Yes, Jesus and the disciples. This is a time period called the apostolic wilderness. So this encapsulated Jesus and the disciples and the persons that lived during the dark ages. Does that make sense? 
Now, does everybody remember in Revelation chapter 12 where it talked about how the woman that she fled into the wilderness? Everybody remember that? All right, let's turn to Revelation. Let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 13. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 13. The Bible says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Now, does anybody know what the word wilderness is a symbol of? It's a symbol of obscurity, a symbol of obscurity. That's the earth. Good point. All right. It says that uh, she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, does anybody know what this is? Yes, this is a symbol of the remnant. This is a symbol of the remnant church. Now, what is another name for the remnant church? Seventh day Adventist. Now, does anybody know who named this church? Was it our pioneers that just got together and said that, you know what? I think seven day Adventist would be a good name to name this, uh, this movement. Is that how our name came into ex existence? No, God literally gave his pronouncement as to what the name would be of this denomination. You know, it's even to the point that when you read the testimonies, inspiration talks about how the name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the fallen churches. A standing rebuke, just the name Seventh-day Adventist. This is a man who wrote a book called Messiah in His Sanctuary. He was a Jewish convert to Seventh-day Adventism. Very brilliant book that he wrote. Now notice what he says in this book. According to scriptural reckoning of time, there were 360 days in a Bible what? All right, now let's turn back to Revelation chapter 12. Now remember, we're talking about the woman in this particular verse, but at the very bottom it says, where she is nourished for a time and time and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now this is, now does anybody know uh, how long this time period is? 1260 years. Now what happened during those 1260 years? Now who here was familiar with the 1260 years? Now, when we say 1260 years, what are we referring to? The dark ages of Europe. All right. Now, when did the 1260 years of papal supremacy, when did it begin? AD. All right. Now, that was only one person who said that. Only one person. Now, you don't have to be ashamed if you didn't know this. But one of the things that we really want to emphasize is that the things that we're talking about is basic seven-day Adventism. This is basic, but unfortunately, again, as we're going to see, Satan has done intentional work to ensure that we as Seventh-day Adventists do not understand who we are. All right, so it started in 538. So if you add 1260 years to 538, what year would it bring you to? 1798. Yes, 1798, 1798. 30 days equaled a Bible month. Satan persecuted the church for a time and times and half a time. 40 and two months, as you read in Revelation 13, for 1260 days, these days are year days. Each day stood for a what? Now, where did he get that principle from? Did he just make this up? Where did he get that from? All right, somebody said Ezekiel 4, 6. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, chapter, pardon, 4 in verse 6. Because I'm telling you, friends, one of the things that we really have to get away from is just being content with being sermonized to. We really have to tax our minds to understand the word of God. You know, I, you know, my wife and I were literally just talking about this. It's literally amazing when you study the history of this movement as to how our pioneers really laid out the foundations of the faith that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, the truths that were opened up to their minds, the, the, the deep, intelligent Bible knowledge that these men and women had was, is literally astounding. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, 
And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a what? Each day for a year. So after this 1260 years, the remnant church would come into prominence. And we found out that that's Seventh-day Adventists as well. All right, so we as Seventh-day Adventists, we are a part of this royal lineage. We are literally just the inheritors of the ancient faith that God gave to all of these men over the course of the centuries. All right, now does anybody know what this is an artist's rendition of? Now, is the second coming important? Very, very important. Now, why is the second coming important? It is the salvation and the resurrection of the just. Salvation and resurrection of the just? Is the blessed hope? All of these different things. When Jesus comes back the second time, it is his efforts to complete the plan of redemption. To complete the plan of redemption. This is the final consummation. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of... Let's turn to Thessalonians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Now, is the second coming of Jesus just in the New Testament? No, it's all throughout the Old Testament as well. All throughout the Old Testament. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we're going to turn to chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Actually, we'll start in chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 13. The Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are what? Now, when this says asleep, are they really just sleeping as in going to rest? No. no, they're dead. But we know that when the Bible talks about sleep in this context, it's speaking about death. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no what? So when we have family and friends who we know have died in Christ, should we be mourning over them as those who do not have any hope? No, no we shouldn't. But there's also a sad reality that we may have friends and family that we know that did not die in Christ. You know, because now, you know, sometimes you'll go to a funeral of a person you know was living in open sin, living a profligate lifestyle, and then the minister from God's pulpit will say that that person is in heaven looking down upon you. And you know that they were living in sin. Now, sadly, is that person going to heaven? Nope. No, they are not. It's a sad declaration, but that's a, just the reality of the facts. If they didn't repent, it says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which uh, also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That text has so many implications. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall do what? Rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with what type of words? With the, so should we frequently be communicating to each other about the second coming? Yes. yes, we should be. This is something that we should talk about often. Now, do you think that Satan hates these truths? Yes, yes he does. Because he knows that it means the end of his existence. Right. Now, notice what this says from Great Controversy. One of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible is that of Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. Now, as we go through this week, we're going to understand in detail this plan of redemption. We as Seventh-day Adventists have been brought into existence to help complete the plan of redemption. To God's pilgrim people so long left to sojourn in the region and shadow of death. So in light of this statement, are we supposed to be setting our affections on the things of this world? 
because we're pilgrims. To us as believers, this world is literally just a hotel. We're just staying for the night. The doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. This is the keynote of the sacred scriptures. Now we're about to go back into history. Notice. Now, does anybody know who this man was? I'll say it again. Yes, this is a man by the name of William Miller. Has anybody ever heard of a man by the name of William Miller? Yes, this is not just a part of Adventist history. This is a part of world history. Now, this is taken from the Chicago Tribune. Exhibit to revisit prophecies from the 1800s. Now, I believe that to some degree, we understand that God used William Miller and his associates to preach the doctrine of the second coming. Around what time? What time period? Yes, the 1830s and the 1840s. Now, did everybody know that? By show of hands. All right, a few of us. This says the public is about to get its first peek in, at a world-class collection of apocalyptic banners and charts used by the Millerite movement, a 19th century religious group that believed the world would end October 22nd, 1844. Now, why did they believe that the world would end October 22nd, 1844? All right, there, there seems to be a mass influx of responses. All right, now let's turn in our Bible to the book of Daniel. Now we're going to go through this prophecy in detail before this week is over. But Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, starting in verse 14. This was the text that brought seven-day Adventists into existence. Now when we say our affirmation of faith on Sabbath... The real affirmation of our faith as Seventh-day Adventists is not Exodus 28 through 11, but it's really Daniel 8, 14, because as we're going to find out, we as Seventh-day Adventists did not start keeping the Sabbath because of Exodus 28 through 11. We started keeping the Sabbath because of Daniel 8, 14. All right, it says, and he said unto me unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Now, William Miller and his associates, what did they think was the sanctuary? They thought that the earth was the sanctuary. And as a result of that, they believed that Jesus would come October 22nd, 1844. Now, this is a trivia question. Now, we know that Jesus didn't come back, obviously, but what happened on October 22nd, 1844? What happened? Grace disappointment, okay. What happened? What happened in heaven? All right, mass influx of answers. Okay. Okay, so Jesus moved from the holy. Now let's read that in the book of Daniel. Let's read Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 9. Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 9. It says, I beheld till thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Now, who is the ancient of days? Yes, God the Father. So when it's saying that the ancient of days did sit, this was actually depicting God the Father sitting down on the throne in the most holy place. It says, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning what? A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was said, and the books were what? They were open. Now, who are these, uh, who are these uh, ministers that were standing before God the Father? Angels. Now, now just think about this. It says ten thousand times ten thousand. Now, what is ten thousand times ten thousand? It's a hundred million. Now, mind you, this was how, how much Daniel could actually compute it, but there's way more than a hundred million angels. Now, does anybody know approximately how tall an angel is? Now, how tall was Adam and Eve? How tall was Adam when he was created? 
Yes, about 15 to 17 feet tall. And angels are taller than Adam. Now, what do you think would have to be the wingspan of the angels if they're almost 20 feet tall? I mean, just think about that. Almost a 30 foot wingspan for these angels. And there were a hundred million of them in the sanctuary at the same time. Now, how massively big do you think the heavenly sanctuary must be? Now, do you think that we serve an awesome God? Amen. Yes, we do. We serve an omnipotent and powerful God. Yes. All right. Now, let's jump down to verse 13. It says, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near what? Before him. So this was Jesus following God the Father into the most holy place to sit down next to him on the throne. Does that make sense? And this is what happened on October 22nd, 1844. But the Millerites did not understand this. This is taken from a very powerful book. Now, I want to make a note of this book. This book, The Great Second Advent Movement, It's Rise and Progress, Sister White specifically gave her endorsement that every Seventh-day Adventist should read this book. This book was written by a man by the name of J.N. Loughborough. He was one of our pioneers. And this book literally documents the rise and progress of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. From 1840 to the autumn of 1844, the, la the labors of elders Miller and Himes were largely united as they went from city to city in the summer with their mammoth tent in the winter in churches and public halls. It may be of interest to mention by name some of the men who acted a prominent part with Elder Himes. First to hand the list is Charles Fitch. Then we have Dr. Josiah Litch, Elon Galusha, and E.R. Penny. So there were many men, God-fearing men, that united with William Miller in order to do this work. Now, does everybody see what this is? This is a symbol of children. Now, do you know that during this time of the 1830s and 40s, that God was literally raising up little children to preach the first angel's message? Notice. So in light of this, do you think that we need to be teaching our children these truths? Because if our children can memorize the lyrics of Selena Gomez and Taylor Swift and all of these rap songs, do you think that they can learn the truths of God's word? Yes. In this connection, we will notice how the Lord wrought to introduce the proclamation in those countries where the law forbade the preaching of anything contrary to the established church. Sweden was one of those countries. A little girl, only about what year of age? Only five years of age, who had never learned to read or sing, one day in a most solemn manner, sang correctly a long Lutheran hymn, and then with great power ex proclaimed, the hour of his judgment is come. Could you just imagine that? Seeing a five-year-old little child be so possessed with the Holy Spirit that they get up and start proclaiming that the hour of his judgment is come. This movement spread from town to town, other children proclaiming the message, also in Norway and Germany. But did Jesus come on October 22nd, 1844? No, he didn't. And as a result of that, there was something called the Great Disappointment. The Great Disappointment. This is our history. This says from Hiram Edson, one of the uh, pioneers of that time, our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I have never experienced before. Do we really want Jesus to come back like these men wanted Jesus to come back? Yes. Or, our, or, our, or are our affections... So set upon the things of this world that we actually want to put off his coming. Because I'm telling you, when you study the history of these pioneers, the sacrifices these men and women literally went under in order to propagate these truths, we really don't know what sacrifice is. You know, I, was, I remember reading a statement in the testimonies 
where Sister White was talking about that during the early days of the Adventist movement, when they would go and travel from city to city, when they would sleep in hotels, they would purposely not even eat breakfast so that they could save money to put back into the work. And sometimes we complain when we don't have breakfast on time. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept until the day. I mean, you would have literally think somebody died how much they were weeping. But do you think that God brought joy back to their hearts? Yes. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 actually depicts the experience of the early Adventists during this time. Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 5. Revelation chapter 10, starting in verse 5. It says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever who created heaven, and the things that are there, that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Verse 9. It says, and I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. Now, just as a, another trivia, what is this little book that is being given? The book of Daniel. It's the book of Daniel. Now, how do you know it's the book of Daniel? <laughs> you have to go read the book of Daniel. All right. It says, and he said unto me, take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as what? Sweet as honey. So this was the experience of the early Adventists as they were eating up the books of Daniel, as they were studying Daniel 814, it was sweet to them. But notice, yes, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was what? So as they were eating up, waiting for the second coming of Jesus, once it went and digested, it was bitter. They received a disappointment. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and what? And kings. So even though there was a disappointment, God still had these faithful brethren to get up and to prophesy again. Does that make sense? And thus was birthed the Seventh-day Adventist movement. So we see here a symbol, artist rendition of God, the Father, the most holy place. Great controversy. The subject of the sanctuary was the what? This was the key. I'm going to give you a caveat. Let's turn in our Bibles. We're already in Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse... 7. Revelation chapter 3, starting verse 7. Now, Revelation chapter 3, what church is this speaking of? Anybody know? The church of Philadelphia. Laodicea comes a little bit later in the chapter. This is the church of Philadelphia. The church of Philadelphia literally depicted the people of God during this time, the 1830s and 1840s. Notice, and to the angel of the church... In Philadelphia, right, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of what? Of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man what? This same key of David that was given to this Millerite movement was this same key that the prophet is talking about in great controversy. This subject of the sanctuary is what brought a knowledge of the truth of God to the people of God at that time. Does that make sense? The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth connected and what? You know, sometimes I literally contemplate the fact that it's so amazing that we as Seventh-day Adventists 
literally believe a faith that has no error in it. We literally proclaim a faith that literally has absolutely no error in it. That is an amazing feat. Showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his what? So what we need to understand is what is our position and work as Seventh-day Adventists? Because as we went over this morning, Satan is using so many things, the sports, the media, relationships, all of these things to distract us from the position and work that we should be doing at this time. Does that make sense? As the disciples of Jesus, after the terrible night of their anguish and disappointment, were glad when they saw the Lord, so did those now rejoice who looked in faith for his second coming. They had expected him to appear in glory to give reward to the servants, his servants. Light from the sanctuary illumined the past, the present, and the future. They knew that God had led them by his unerring providence. You see, one of the great things that Satan has done, unfortunately, with us as Seventh-day Adventists, he's made it so that these things are not really taught anymore. These things may be skimmed over in an every so now and then evangelistic campaign, but on a general basis, we're not really taught systematically our history and who we are. This is a principle. Any people that have been brought into slavery, they have been stripped of their history. The black Africans that were brought over to North America were they stripped of their history. When the Hebrews were stripped of their freedom and brought into servitude to the Egyptians, were they stripped of their history. This is a principle. This is one of the reasons why God had to declare the Ten Commandments from Sinai was because they forgot who they were. Does that make sense? All right, it says, but gotten again into a lively hope, they rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. All right. Now, this is a symbol of the three angels' messages. Let's turn, we're still in Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Now, we're going to specifically read the third angel's message. Specifically, the third angel's message. And we're going to start in verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of who? Now, is this a serious message? So is it a light thing to receive the mark of the beast? No, it's a serious thing. Now, who here wants to receive the mark of the beast? No, by the grace of God. Now, this is taken from the BBC, Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist Church is a, a millennialist Protestant Christian denomination that was founded in the 1860s in the USA. Now, does anybody know the specific year that the, uh, the, um, the Seventh-day Adventist uh, denomination was brought into existence as far as the, the organization? Yes, 1863. The name Seventh-day Adventist is based on the church's observance of the biblical Sabbath on what? The, so even the BBC says it's, it's the biblical Sabbath. Advent means coming and refers to their belief that Jesus will soon return to this earth. Now, does anybody know who this is? Ellen G. White. Now, are you afraid of claiming the prophet? I hope not. Revelation chapter 12. 
You see, because this is a principle. We're going to, we'll read this and then we'll bring out the principle. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, 1217, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, what does the word remnant mean? That which remains, the last. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, the commandments of God, we understand that those are the things that God has contained in his word, specifically the Ten Commandments. Now, we're going to jump down to Revelation chapter 19 in verse 10. And we're going to see what this testimony of Jesus is. Revelation 19, 10. It says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? The spirit of prophecy. So principle. If you claim to be a Seventh-day Adventist, but you don't believe in the ministry of Ellen G. White, are you really a Seventh-day Adventist? Let me ask you a question. If you were going to uh, in for surgery on your brain and the neurosurgeon that you were talking to as you were getting your consultation before the surgery, the surgeon said, you know, before we do the surgery, I just want to let you know that I actually don't believe in physiology. I believe in I believe in anatomy. But I don't believe in physiology. Now, would you consider that man a real brain surgeon? So how in the world can you claim to be a Seventh-day Adventist and not believe in one of the fundamental essential parts of your faith? What if you met a Muslim person who said that I'm a Muslim, but I just don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad? Are they a real, are they a real Muslim? If you met a Mormon who said that I, you know, I believe in all of these different things, but I don't believe that Joseph Smith was a real prophet. Are they a real Mormon? No, they're not. Now, again, this is not as a means to, to ostracize those who hold these positions, but you see, Satan has systematically construed our thinking to make us believe that we're following God when we're really not. All right, now this is taken from that uh, same book, The Great Second Advent Movement, now, notice this testimony during the ministry of Sister White. Notice, I will mention another medical examination that I witnessed in Parkville, St. Joseph County. Now, again, during Sister White's time, did everybody believe that she was a true prophet? No, of course not. Now, during the time of Jeremiah, did everybody believe that Jeremiah was a true prophet? Did everybody believe that, that, uh, that Enoch was a true prophet? Did everybody believe that David was a true prophet? No, but remind, you know, just think about this. Daniel in particular, the Bible says, as a result of him studying the book of Jeremiah, he came to the understanding that the 70 week captivity was coming to an end. Now if so much of Israel didn't believe that Jeremiah was a true prophet, how did Daniel come to the conclusion that Jeremiah was a true prophet? Is that a good question? All right. So let's notice this. At the close of the exhortation given by Mrs. White to a large congregation that had assembled in the Adventist meeting house, the blessing of God rested on her in a remarkable degree. And she was taken off in vision while seated in her chair. Now I want us to put ourselves in this particular situation. If you were literally witnessing this, if we could go back in that time and Sister White was literally sitting on this bench, and you saw her literally being taken off into vision, would you believe that she was really receiving a revelation from God? Yes. Imagine, just think about this. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her that the Holy Spirit was literally going to get her pregnant and that she was going to conceive a child, she said, you know, blessed, you know, be, you know, God and all of those things. And she was willing to do that. Now, there was a man who was trying to marry uh, Mary, and who was that man? Imagine you being a man, and the woman that you are patrolled to get married to, you find out that she's pregnant, and then she tells you that the Holy Spirit got me pregnant. Imagine the type of real-world predicament that that would put you in. But as a result of that, the angel Gabriel came to Joseph in a dream and communicated to him that the thing that was going to be born of Mary was of the Holy Ghost. All right, it says, 
There was present Dr. Brown, a hale, strong man physically, a spirit medium. So there was a spirit medium that was there. He had said that her visions were the same as spirit mediumship. So he was trying to say that the same demons that possess me are the same demons that possess her. And that if she had one where he was, he could bring her out of it in one minute. An invitation was given for anyone who desired to so come forward and by examination satisfy themselves as to her condition while in vision. The doctor came forward, but before he had half completed his examination, he turned deathly pale. Why did he turn pale? And shook like an aspen leaf. Elder White said, will the doctor report her condition? He replied, she does not want. She doesn't breathe. Now, is it possible to be alive and not be breathing? No, it's impossible. But Sister White was alive and she wasn't breathing. These are one of the hallmarks of what happens when God takes a person into vision. Are these the same type of things that happened to the prophet Daniel? Yes, yes the same exact things. And rapidly made his way to the door. Those at the door who knew of his boasting said, go back and do as you said you would bring that woman out of her vision in great agitation he grasped the knob of the door but was not permitted to open it until inquiry was made by those near the door doctor what is it he replied god only knows let me out of this house you see the reality is is that the demons that were possessing him were coming into direct contact with the holy spirit and they were getting agitated and he went out. Now, do you think it's important to understand this history? It's critically important because we're going to find out that as Seventh-day Adventists, what we believe is going to be vehemently attacked. And if we don't know what we believe and why we believe it, we're going to easily give up this faith. It was evident that the spirit that influenced him as a medium was no more at rest in the presence of the power that controlled Mrs. White in vision than were the demoniacs in the days of the Savior who inquired, Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? A similarity is seen in this circumstance that recorded in the experience of Daniel the prophet. Daniel the prophet. Sir. Yes. Okay. That tells me the demons knew there would come a time when they would be destroyed, but they did not know when the time was, which is why they asked Christ, have you come to destroy us before the time? No, that's a very good point. You see, you know, one of the things that we're going to find out is that from the very time that the plan of redemption, the sanctuary service was given to the human race, Satan studied the sanctuary service in detail and actually, let's turn to Revelation. We're already in Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 10. All right. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength. And the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and what? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Notice verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a what? So you see, Satan intelligently understands that his time is short. And he actually understands intelligently the time that he's going to be destroyed. But Satan tries to deceive us into believing that we can't know the time. Now this is not to be confused with the second coming of Christ. We're told very clearly that we don't know the day nor the hour. 
All right. Now, this is a symbol of the, the, the uh, Revelation 12 that we saw before. Now, does anybody know what this building is? Yes, this is a symbol of the General Conference building in Silver Spring, Maryland. This is the headquarters of our faith. This is a symbol of the remnant. Now, notice what this says in Acts of the Apostles. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of what? So is the church, is it organized to hold potlucks merely? Is it organized to merely hold programs for young people? That's not its only purpose. It was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the what? Now, let me ask you a question. Now, do Roman Catholics profess that they are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes. What about uh, Baptists? Do they profess to be spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ? So when this says the gospel, it must be speaking of a specific gospel. Does that make sense? From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world, his fullness and his what? The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the full, the final and full display of the hatred of God. The love of God. You see, the message that God has given us to bear to the world is the final revelation and manifestation of the love of God. Amen, Amen indeed. All right, now this is from volume seven of the testimonies. Volume seven. Very important statement. Seven day Adventists have been chosen by what? Now, were the children of Israel chosen by God? Now, why were the children of Israel especially chosen by Jehovah? Why were they chosen by Jehovah? Was it because God was just arbitrarily choosing them above everybody else? Now, who was the progenitor of the Jewish nation? What man? Abraham. Abraham. Now, the reason why God chose Abraham was because unlike his other family members and the rest of the world, he made a conscious decision to serve God. And as a result of that, God chose him because the rest of the world did not want to follow the Lord. The reason why God raised up this movement was not because he bestowed arbitrary blessings upon us as a people, but it was because the fallen Protestant churches turned their backs on the message. And as a result, God raised up this movement. This says, as a peculiar people separate from the what? So should we, should we be attached to the world? No. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. Notice this statement. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man, have been committed to them to be given to the what? So the greatest wealth of truth has been given to who? Us as seven-day Adventists. Now again, unfortunately, Satan has so construed things that we do not really understand what we have. Because as we're going to find out, as seven-day Adventists, God has literally given us the solution to all of the problems that are perplexing the world. Do you know that contained in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are literally the solutions to world hunger? Are literally the solutions to the economic problems that all of the nations of the world are currently facing? Are the solutions to the education issue that we have in the United States and around the world? Is the solution to the problems that we have in our families? This is why God gave us books like the Ministry of Healing. This is why God literally gave us a book called Child Guidance. I mean, imagine this. God literally designates an entire book to teach you how to raise your children, and we still don't read it. God has called his church in this day, as he called ancient Israel, to stand as a light in the earth by the mighty cleaver of what? Now, we're going to notice what the mighty cleaver is. 
the messages of the first, second, and third angel's messages. So it was, as it were, God made a cleaver out of these messages and cut us from the quarry of the world. The three angels of Revelation 14 represent the people who accept the light of God's messages and go forward to proclaim them. Now we're going to go a little bit through history and we're going to come to a close. Now does anybody know what this place is right here? This is a symbol of something called Emmanuel Missionary College. Does anybody know what this institution is called today? Andrews University, which is a far cry from Emmanuel Missionary College. Anybody know what this institution is? This was something called the Boulder, Colorado Sanitarium. This institution is not even in existence anymore. And as we're going to find out, God called us as Seventh Adventists to establish sanitariums and not hospitals. Does anybody know what a sanitarium is? My show of hands. Has anybody here ever heard of the word sanitarium? Anybody know what this institution is right here? A symbol of something called Battle Creek Sanitarium. Anybody know who established that institution? Man by the name of John Harvey Kellogg, the man who started cornflakes, who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, but he backslid, and we're actually going to go through that history. Anybody know who this is? Any, uh, this institution this is? Yes, a symbol of Walla Walla Sanitarium, and this institution is no longer in existence anymore. Anybody know why these institutions uh, shut down? Anybody know why? Well, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Not today, but soon. This is a symbol of something called divinely ordained institutions. Now, this is going to show us how our institutions were brought into existence. We shall be attacked on what? Now, I want us to notice something as we're going through this. Does everybody know, notice how many spirit of prophecy quotations we're going through? This is to emphasize that we need to be reading the spirit of prophecy. Who here has read the book Great Controversy from cover to cover? Who here has read the Conflict of Ages series? Who here has studied the Conflict of Ages series? Because there's a difference between reading and studying. Who here has read and studied the book Ministry of Healing? What about Christ's object lessons? What about steps to Christ? What about the testimonies? You see, brothers and sisters, if we do not study these things, Satan will take advantage of us. You know, there's a statement in volume five of the testimonies, and it literally says that many of us are going completely contrary to the will of God simply because we don't read the spirit of prophecy. We shall be tried to the utmost... Now, was Jesus trying to the utmost? Yes. yes, he was. We do not want to hold our faith simply because it was handed down to us by our what? So it's not enough that we're third, fourth, and fifth generation Adventists. We need to understand the truth for ourselves. Such a faith will not stand the terrible test that is before us. Now, does, when this says test, anybody know what that's referring to? Yes, the Sunday law specifically, and we're going to get into that as our week of prayer goes on. What real reason have we uh, have for coming out from the world as a separate and distinct people? We want to know why our different institutions have been established. Does that make sense? All right. It says the influence of these messages, the three angels has been deepening and widening, setting in motion the springs of action in thousands of hearts, bringing into existence these institutions. So do you get it? So as these messages went out, people's hearts were impressed, and as a result of them being impressed, the institutions were brought into existence. Does that make sense? All right. This is our last line right here. Does anybody know what this institution is? This is a symbol of something called Madison College. Anybody ever heard of Madison College? Only a few of us. Madison College was a self-supporting institution established by Seventh-day Adventists in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, 
in the uh, around the turnish of the night of the 20th century madison college in 1917 was that a long time ago it was over 100 years ago is this institution still in existence no it's shut down we're going to find out why these institutions were systematically shut down all right, this is taken from manuscript releases. The work, now the reason why we're going through this, we want to gain an understanding as to how God was leading this movement. The triumphs that God gave to us as a people. The work that the laborers have accomplished at Madison has done more to give a correct knowledge of what an all-round education means than any other school that has been established by seven-day Adventists in America. You see, at this school, students could literally go to college and come out with no debt. And as they would go to this college, they would learn how to build their own houses. They would learn how to make their own clothes. They would learn how to grow their own food. They would learn how to minister to the needs of others. Seven-day Adventist schools was not primarily established to make seven-day Adventist uh, businessmen and all of these different professions that we tend to get into but it was specifically designed to train young people to finish the work. All right, now this is a symbol of some of the people that helped to start Madison College. Anybody know who that person is? Yes, Ellen White. Anybody know who this person is? That is Willie White. That was her son, Willie White. And this, anybody know who that is? That's E.A. Sutherland, one of the starters of the institution, the, the, the place. Anybody know who this is? That is P.T. McGann. P.T. McGann. I believe this is P.T. McGann. It could be him, but I believe it's him. P.T. McGann. This is Men of the Mountains. The Madison School was born under conditions that approximated those of the pioneer days. Notice, their tables were of plank their dressers of dry goods, their food was largely restricted to what they had found in their fields and the products of their dairy. Now, it's important for us to understand that when this crisis breaks, that if we are not growing our own food, we are going to accept the mark of the beast out of necessity. We're going to say, you know, God understands the fact that I have to feed my children I must accept the mark of the beast so I can go to Walmart and get some groceries. God understands that I need to feed my children. I need to go to hy to get some groceries to feed my children. This is why God told us as so many Adventists that we were to be living in the country. You know, there was a person who thought, you know, in Bible days, who thought that they could live in the city and still minister to souls. Anybody know who I'm speaking of? Lot. Lot thought that he could live in Sodom and Gomorrah and still do evangelism while living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, what happened to, to, uh, to Lot's family? They were lost. There was not one soul that Lot won in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not one soul. And it's amazing so many times when I hear seven-day Adventist pastors and elders, conference presidents who try to bash country living as if it's some fanatical precept, not realizing that these things are just contained in the word of God. This says the body must be accustomed to hard work and a simple diet. No steam heated, electrically lighted buildings, no intricate, expensive machinery, no wealth of imported foodstuffs were appropriated for the men and women in training for the service to the mountains. Now, this is not saying that there's anything wrong with electricity and having a blender and all these things. But if we're going to train young people to be missionaries, everything just can't be provided for them, especially if they're going to foreign countries. All right. Does anybody know who this woman was? Yes, a woman by the name of Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, Madison was so successful as an institution that even during the, the vestiges of the Great Depression, they were completely and almost wholly unaffected by the depression because they were growing their own food and they were self-sustaining. As a result of that, the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, actually went down to Madison to study what they were doing. Who here knew this? 
Notice what Eleanor said. In the brief time I spent in Nashville, Tennessee yesterday, one visit stands out in my mind. Secretary Hall, who is the current Secretary of Education, had asked me to see Mr. Floyd, um, and when I met him, I was immediately struck by the fine earnestness of his face. He came to tell me of an educational project in which he was deeply interested. I was told of an educational institution, Madison College, which had received contributions for its original investment amounting to 430 acres of land outside the city of Nashville. The faculty earned its own living on the side while making teaching a full-time job. Mr. Uh, Brallier and his wife lived on $15 a month those first years. Could you imagine living on $15 a month? Obviously, of course not. You know, because of inflation, this has greatly degenerated our economy. Now they live with greater comfort on $35 a month. We're going to jump down to the bottom. He added that he had made a survey of a thousand of his graduates and not one among them had been forced to accept help either from the government or private agencies during these difficult years of the Depression. So some, you know, Seventh-day Adventist educators will tell us that we need to receive government subsidies so that we can pay for Adventist education. But did Madison have to do this? Because they were following God's plan. Can you improve upon God's plan? No, no you can't. You cannot improve upon God's plan. And in light of that, we're going to come to a close. And my appeal is very simple. If you want to say that today, tonight, I want to make the stand that I really want to live this seven-day Adventist message, I just ask you to raise your hand wherever you are. If you know that some of what has been presented is new to you, but you are saying, even though I don't know everything, even though I profess to be a Seventh-day Adventist, even for years on end, I want to make the declaration today, tonight, that I want to follow the Lord all the way and truly live up to my high calling as a Seventh-day Adventist. And the Lord sees those hands. And in light of that, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, Lord, there is so much that we could have expounded upon this evening, but this is just scratching the surface, but I pray, dear Lord, that this has given us some understanding of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists, the inheritance that was given to us all of these years ago, and so much of Seventh-day Adventism has been lost, dear Lord, but you are causing a revival and a reformation in all of our hearts. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would please be with us so that we can live out these sacred truths in our day-to-day -day lives. And I pray that you would be with us as we come again tomorrow evening. In Jesus' name, amen.